Do you think you have a badass kayak? Do you think it'll turn a lot of heads? Well, join us Saturday, February 24th at Jake's Bait and Tackle for the second annual kayak show and seminar. Starting at 11 a.m. will be the kayak show. The four categories this year are the DIY division, a kayak that costs less than a thousand bucks, the best river kayak setup, the best big water kayak, and the best in show. You will have a ton of kayaks there to be able to show off. If you want to ever get into kayak fishing, this is the time to go look at so many cool rigs and setups. We will also have a ton of seminars with a bunch of great guests. The first one starting at noon will be Mike Ortega of Northern Virginia Kayak Association. At 1 p.m., we'll have Sela Johnson. At 2 p.m., we'll have Jake Harshman. At 3 p.m., we'll have Matt Campbell. And rounding it up at 4 p.m., we'll have Joshua Evans. The overall seminar will be going from 11 a.m. to about 4 to 5 p.m. will be the whole event. If you would like to sign up your kayak, you can me email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, if you'd like to sign up your kayak to have a chance to win a ton of cool prizes, email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. And we will see you Saturday, February 24th at 11 a.m. 19. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 19 away from achieving our goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You will also get 10% off all of your orders to our newest sponsor, Tiger Crankbaits, who won best in show at the Richmond Fishing Expo. You will also gain membership to our private Facebook group com community where we talk about fishing, what's coming up, and you'll be entered into weekly prize giveaways, private live streams and videos, and so much more. If you would like to see Fishing the DMV continue to bring you content, please think about joining. Link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and I hope everyone is having a wonderful January so far. I know this is the the doldrum of the year, really, for, for a lot of anglers across the country. You know, the select few will fly south to Florida for the winter. To me, though... This is a heck of a time of year if you like to chase the brown ones. Um, I know a couple of days ago I went out on I think it was the Shenan yeah, Shenandoah Riverton, Shenandoah River at Riverton, and we caught probably 18 pounds or best five. And it's just it's so awesome that you're not gonna catch a lot, but when you do, it's a good one. And I thought we could bring in a Susquehanna guide here, SJ Scott from SJ Fishing Adventures, just to really kind of talk about the Susquehanna and kind of get his story. Scott, thank you so much for coming in today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, I guess the how we got connected is I, your brother has one of the sickest Instagram accounts, and I saw all these sick photos of him and how he wades the upper Potomac. And I had him on the show to talk about that. And through the grapevine, I was able, able to get in contact with you and really just want to start it off with how did this whole fishing adventure and fishing addiction get started for you? Uh, well, it started off really from my brother as I was, he's 11 years older than I am. So as I was little, he would take me out fishing and, um, you know, as a 10, 11, 12 year old, we'd go out and we started wading the upper Potomac and we've done trips to Canada. And from there, it's just evolved into canoes and kayaks and jet boats and the next jet boat and on it goes. <laughs> The the Can the Canadian thing is awesome. How did you get started in that? That that seems like a cool adventure. Uh, actually, first time I went on that was when I graduated high school. We, uh, my brother and I, did a canoeing trip into Algonquin Provincial Park, and uh, just the whole experience of doing that. And you canoe into a lake. There's nobody there. Um, you feel like you're the first person there. Uh, of course, fishing is usually pretty good. Just the wildlife, all the experiences. So we, we've been going ever since. What is this for people that haven't been up there? What is the smallmouth in the pike fishing like up there? Is it next level? Uh, it can be. Yeah, for sure. Definitely depends on where you go. Uh, the place we went uh, this past fall, um, the fish were big, but not plentiful. But if you wanted a pike fishery, you couldn't ask for anything better than that, than that one. But I mean, there's been other places, 
you know, we catch 100, 150 fish a day per boat. So Holy crap. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah, that's pretty freaking awesome. And, <laughs> and then you you go from that to when did you decide that I want to take a go at being a guide? So I actually started off guiding for Ken Penrod. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, uh, I got a text out of the blue. I wasn't even sure who it was uh, and said something along the lines of, you would be a good guide. Have you ever considered it? I'm like, well, a little bit, but who is this? And, uh, so I did that for a couple of years and then uh, just opened up my own uh, guide business. What was that like working with Ken? Um. <laughs> The PC yeah. version. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. We'll, we'll just say that. I mean, he's been around freaking forever. Like how many people did he have working under him at like his peak? Uh, so when I was there, there was, uh, I don't know, maybe six or seven of us. Dang. So it's an elite group. Yeah. And then did you just get his clientele? And then at that point, were you using a jet boat? Were you in a fiberglass? Like, uh, I had a jet boat then. I just got my uh, rock roof. And, but, you know, you go out, you still search out, find your own clients, do your own advertising. And What was that like then, that transition, when you were like, okay, I started this, you know, I was under somebody's wing. What made you decide, like, I wanted to, it's time for me to break away and do my own thing? Because that can be daunting. Uh, it was easy. Um, you know, with social media, it's easy to get your name out, which, of course, I say that, and I'm terrible because I haven't posted anything in probably two <laughs> years. But, um, but I got enough clients to uh, keep me going for as much as I want a guide. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was pretty easy. So you've been going on eight years now? Yep. That's insane. That's incredible. I mean, and cause the subsequent hand, I'm really realizing there's, there's a bunch of guides on that place too. It's not just one person that dominates the whole area, generally speaking. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of river and I also do the upper Potomac as well. Oh, really? Yeah. What, por oh, what yeah. portion? Uh, so I fish point of rocks to Knoxville falls a lot. Um, I, I have on, um, Jeff Green, and it's something that's interesting to me is like how many people actually do bounce from Upper Potomac to Susky, and I guess it's not that far of a drive, and I guess it depends on where your where your home base is, honestly, to be able to bounce between the two so easily. Um, yeah, I mean it's a pretty good drive. It's about an hour and a half, depending on what section of Susquehanna I go to. But um, I mean it's a world class fishery, so it's it's worth the drive. I had on um. I had on Jake Harshman uh, a, a, a while ago, and he's a big time kayak angler up there. He know he's he's with Jeff Little and um, Torquedo, and really, what I came to the conclusion with after covering the Susky for about a year and some changes, it's inappropriate to cover the Susky as one major body of water because it's so massive. Like you can break it into the Juliata, the lower Susky. Like it, when when you look at that massive place. It, do you break that thing down on a seasonal basis or do you just have one stretch that you like year round? Uh, no, so I will fish from just above Goldsboro all the way up to Sunbury. Uh, and I get bored fishing the same water all the time. So <laughs> if I don't have a trip, I Me just too. hit a different section. And uh, I mean, you do find trends each year that there will be a section that fishes better. Uh, than other sections. So, you know, if I have a trip, then we'll, we'll hit that. Uh, but it, it's so variable, too. It depends on river conditions, what's happening. Um, you, know, if, uh, you know, you get a high water event, you might have wa uh, clean water coming out of the Juniata, so you fish below that to take advantage of that. Or uh, So it's just a lot of variables. That trying to gamble on what's going to be the best spot. But when you think of the upper Potomac, which is in my back, I can throw a rock to, to Williamsport here right behind me. Um, the stretch from, let's say the, the, the confluence at Harper's Ferry to the, the, the falls, that is really small compared to the Susky. And, and so when you talk about flow rates, what flow flow rates are you looking at above you? Let's say it starts raining 
where you think, okay, the section I was going to fish below that is going to be blown out because of how long it is. Um, yeah, so I think it's roughly like 12 hours from the Sunbury gauge to the Harrisburg gauge. Okay. So you can kind of track whether, you know, what part's rising or what part might be dropping. Um, but you're also looking at tributaries and things like that, um, which will clear up quicker. Uh, where the rain came from, because sometimes one half of the Susquehanna will run more clean than the other, based on whether it's uh, coming from the north branch or the west branch. What What are some of the major tributaries besides the um, Juniata? Uh, well, really any of the creeks, bigger creeks, Penn's Creek, Sherman's Creek, they'll all have impact in, in the areas below there. Um, I forget the name on it. Millersville, Millersville. You know, some of those bigger creeks, you, you can find cleaner water coming out below those. Yeah. I, I think like a lot of guys down now, down in Northern Virginia, when you grow up fishing the Shenandoah and the upper Potomac, and it's like, it's a river that you can take a baseball and throw it across. And, if, and I think if you've never been to the Susky, you can't truly appreciate the, the whole like mile wet foot deep thing when you're breaking this down. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot of it's water. a shit ton of water. And when you're fishing the wintertime, I, I keep hearing this from a lot of the old um, river rats that I have on the show, which is you got to fish slow fast. But how the hell do you do that when you're fishing a new portion? It's one thing if you have two or three wintering holes that you've mapped out. Okay, they should be here. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to give it my time and then bug out. If you're fishing a new stretch, like, do you have an internal clock? How long do you want to give an area before you bounce? Um, so if I go out, I feel confident I'm going to catch fish. So I'm not going to spend a long time in an area. I'm going to keep moving until the day goes far enough that the fish will tell you if you're not going to catch many fish or not. Um, but whether it's a new section, how big it is, you know, a small mouth is a small mouth. They don't know if they live in the Susquehanna or the Shenandoah or the Upper Potomac. So their behavior is pretty much the same. Um, so you're looking, well, it's all variable depending on what the river conditions are. are but, um, you know, if it's low and clear, you're looking for kind of that milky green where the water's a little deeper. If it's high, you're looking for some sort of current protection. You know, a shoreline eddy or a rock ledge or the back of an island. That's that's um, interesting though. I like how you said that, like, you know, smallmouth is a smallmouth. Because like the upper Potomac generally doesn't rip like the Susky does. But I guess it's all relative, right? So uh, the a slow current on the Susky is probably a fast current for the upper Potomac smallmouth, but that Susky smallmouth doesn't know that. It it still thinks the current's slower on a slow current day for the Susky. Sure, yeah. Which yeah, yeah. what section you hit too? You know, the Upper Potomac you run through uh, Point of Rocks, Lander, the islands, the ledges. I mean, you get uh, some fairly heavy flow going through there too. Not as much as the Susquehanna, but, but I, I guess my way my brain's working now is what messes up is the angler. The angler who's never gone to the Susquehanna is like, oh, the current's ripping, so I need to adjust something. Not thinking like, what is this fish used to? Where you have an advantage because if you're on the Susquehanna bunch, you'd be like, well, the current's kind of slow and that might change up their behavior a little bit versus somebody who's never been there before. They're like, oh, this shit's like ripping insanely fast when it's like, nope, this is a slow day for them. Um, <laughs> and that's, that can be really important knowledge when it comes to how they, they set up this time of year. Sure. Yeah. And like I said, you know, I believe that I'm going to catch fish. So I'm going to find something that looks likely I'm going to fish it five, 10 minutes. Uh, you know, you get a bite or you don't. And, you know, and you pretty much break down the Susquehanna or I do uh, east side, west side, middle. Um, you know, if it's dirty, you're looking for cleaner water. So, uh, you know, you start on the uh, west side. If the water's too dirty, you're not getting bit. You move to the middle, you move to the east. And, you know, so I find there's little subtle patterns that fish on the east side will bite better in dirtier water than they do on the west side. Um, but, you know, just all time on the water and you figure out little tidbits to work. For. That is so important for, for, for everyone listening on YouTube, Patreon, Apple Podcasts. If you've never been to the Susky, let's say uh, if you're listening now and you're just a Shenandoah guy, you can probably set your boat or kayak dead nuts in the middle of the Shenandoah and make every cast 
down the middle, left bank, right bank. The Susquehanna, and maybe like the major part of the Upper Potomac after the confluence, you really, you can't do that. You have to work left to right. It is legitimately a mile wide. Um, and, and I guess what would blow me away if I was a new angler is not only do you have to pick the right stretch, but then like you said, you have to go from one bank to the other. When you pick a stretch, how big of a stretch, if you're a newbie trying to go here, how big of a stretch do you want to try to break down in a day? So everything, there's always a spot within a spot. Um, so, you know, you're starting looking for what's a likely spot to work, whether it's that little bit of deeper water, if it's clear and clean, um, or if it's an eddy behind an island or a shoreline. And to then try to take that small spot and pick it apart. Because within every one of those, those fish will... They might sit at the top of the eddy if they're aggressive. Sometimes they sit in the tails. Sometimes they're out on the scene. Sometimes they're up on the bank. You know, and I think what a lot of people don't put enough into is just really trying to figure out the pattern. Mm. Um, you know, at any time of year, you know, in the fall, a lot of times the wood's a good pattern. Um, you know, when you catch a fish on wood, you see another laydown, go to that laydown see if that pattern pays off um but yeah it's really just kind of once you get that pattern then all you just looking around the river trying to find something similar to what you're fishing i, I think that's hard for people because they do get daunted immediately when they look at something so big and and especially this time of year where it guess what it does concentrate them i mean in the summertime the blessing and the curse is there's probably a fish behind every freaking rock. It's six inches long, but there's probably a fish behind every rock versus now you, you got to cover it. You got to find those, those sweet spots. W what is the perfect, what temperature do you think really is correlated with wintertime fishing? So, and, and why I say that is last year I talked to Chris Gorsuch and he said in 2022, it felt like we had kind of like a late fall water temperature wise and, and it took a while for the fish to get into those winter patterns so what temperatures do you look for when you think like yep they're going to be there you know it varies so much um but probably below 45 degrees i'd say is when you'll start to see you know and there's fish all over the river um they're not all necessarily in a wintering hole, so to speak, or a community hole. Uh, I just fished uh, the Susquehanna the other day. You know, we caught 40 some fish, um, fishing four miles of bank. Wow. Um, pretty much any reasonable shoreline eddy had fish in it. That's insane. That's freaking insane. I mean, it's almost like overload because there's so many spots on the place. And, and depth wise, honestly, because of the flathead, which we have probably covered at nauseum at this point with this show, what ha, has the depth changed for flathead catfish in the smallmouth wintering holes? Uh, I think you don't find the smallmouth in these community holes as much as you did before. Um, but I'm still, I pretty much fish the same as before, you know, we had the flatheads coming in and affecting it. Um, I mean, they've always been in these spots, uh, but you know, sometimes it's easier when you can get to a community hole and you can sit there and fish all day and not have to leave. But I like to get out away from the boats, find something new, see what you can learn, have a new experience. How many fish generally speaking? Cause I, I've heard the old stories of like a 200 fish in a wintering hole. Is that kind of a bygone era like what on average do you think how many fish are in a wintering school and it just meant generically speaking uh you know for the susquehanna i mean we caught between two and ten fish in an wow. eddy the other day that's pretty good that's not bad at all <laughs> oh yeah yeah no that was uh it was fun what what kind of what is the average size that people are seeing right now 
Uh, so we had a 20, four 19s. I'm not sure how many 18s. I think maybe we had two or fish, two or three fish around 12 or 13 inches, but it was a, uh, it was a good size day. It, it's just, I think that's the remarkable thing where I think you guys get spoiled is like the size that you get there consistently versus us. Though, honestly, I don't know if you heard some of the stuff I've said with, with, with Jeff, um, the upper Potomac, man. Holy shit. That thing is turned around a lot. Um, I think a couple years ago, it took 22 pounds to win the Brunswick tournament that they held held there. Like that place is coming. There's big fish in the uh, upper Potomac. If I had to go out one day uh, to catch a 20 inch fish, I would go to the upper Potomac. Really? Yes. Why? It, why do you think that is? Is it just having its its time in the spotlight, you think? Um, it's a smaller body of water. The biggest fish are going to take up the best areas. And if you can find that area, that fish is going to be there. Um, and there's fewer of those spots than on the Susquehanna. Mm, okay. That makes, that makes, yeah, that makes actually really good sense. Um, yeah. And it probably doesn't have the, the mass of like, you know, those 23 plus inch fish comparatively to the Susky but then you have more area to kind of get through. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I mean, there's sections on the upper Potomac that I believe these big fish are there almost year round. I can believe that. Uh, I've caught the same fish in spring, summer, and winter uh, out of the same hole. Do you think, so I think uh, guys in the, in the comment section down below, um, you can tell me if I'm wrong or if I'm full of crap. I think the old Maryland record was the Susky, the weird portion where the Susky and Maryland connect. Do you ever think the Maryland record could be broken on the upper Potomac for a smallmouth? No, no, not a chance. The uh, Maryland state record is like eight pounds, three ounces. It's a big dog. Like yeah. Uh, uh, no, not, not for a river fish. They have to work too hard. Um, I think this record came in Liberty. out of Liberty. I think, yep, yep. And, uh, you know, those fish, when they can feed on schools of shad or shiners or whatever they're eating, uh, they're just going to put on weight like they can't do in a, uh, in the river. Dang, that's a big fish. But honestly, if, if Liberty Reservoir is private, I wonder if that record should even count. Because if I raise a largemouth in my pond... And it gets to be 17 pounds. I don't know. Like, should that count? Like, I don't know. Anyway, that's a, that's a whole never conversation for for another day. Good question, actually, because there's a couple a uh, couple of the records are from farm ponds. Yeah, so. yeah, because it's like honestly, if you broke into Bass Pro Shop in Richmond, and, I mean, you can't count that as a state record if you yank it with a jig. Um, I don't know. It, it, <laughs> I don't know. That just that's interesting to me because like I think the New River. Uh, yeah, I know the 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 Virginia state record came from a river. Um, and I think the genes might be a little bit different down there because those guys are dinosaurs, but I don't know. I think it does take like the absolute perfect circumstance to, to get one of those big ones there. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I'm just glad that the upper Potomac and the Shenandoah are coming back in our neighborhood because they had a massive fish kill like 10 years ago. I think it is now. Um, just so to see those places come back is awesome. Um, but you know, well, there was a, a big drop in population after 2018. I mean, 19 was pretty tough. 20 was fair. I mean, it's, they're slowly progressing. Well, we back. Had, For yeah. Susquehanna, yeah, we time. had those high water events, I think, right? In those two years back to back, which killed the spawn. We, we had a lot yeah. of bad water. They killed a lot of fish, too. Yeah, that, that's true. That's really true. Um, I, I think that's what people don't understand, like how, if you live around the Susquehanna, how blessed you are to have it where it's been able to sustain, like it's been consistent for so long where, Again, as a guy that grew up on the Shenandoah and the Potomac, you had a couple of bad years. We were screwed for a while, but it seems like the Susky has just been able to keep turning them out. Like it has bad years, but it's not like the Shenandoah River bad. Yeah, no, the Shenandoah had a it had a rough run, but uh, you know the Susquehanna. You know, in 2019, 20, they were kind of slow. I mean, 2018 was insane. Um, I loved it. All the high water and. I mean, we were still baiting from that's so cool. March until uh, November. Damn, that's so. awesome. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, and you brought up baits now. As we're basically, we're in winter. Spoiler, guys. What 
if you had to pick a handful of baits to go out there and actually start and start doing some smallmouth fishing on the Susquehanna, what, what are you, what are you taking in your boat? Um, uh, well, I brought some props. Yay. <laughs> you know, there's so many baits that you can catch a fish on, but I think a lot of people, and we all love to hoard as much tackle as we yes. can get, but pick a bait and learn how to fish it well, and then go to the next bait or as you go into the next season. Uh, but really, you pull up, I mean, a tube. Purple, okay. Uh, yep, so that's one of my go-to colors when the water's milky green, if it's dirty. Um, it's a June crawl or purple crawl tube. Um, and I mean, I'm basic. I don't have a whole lot of, you know, I'll fish three or four colors. Um, you know, when the water's clear. Perfect. I got to go backwards. Just a green pumpkin, purple. Pretty much everything I throw has got purple in it. Bass love it for some reason. Um, it, it, that to me is so fascinating because like when you interview one guy that says purple in a tube is good, that's one thing. When you've interviewed like 50 and they're all like, you got to have a little purple in one of your tubes. It's like, okay, th what the hell is it that these smallmouth like about purple in clear water sometimes? It, it's crazy. Uh, so the crayfish, when they molt, they get kind of a purple hue. So I suspect maybe that's the okay. connection, but, uh, but it also seems that it's very visible. Hmm. Uh, in dirty water. So, you know, when we were just fishing the other day, and uh, so I was just using, it's basically a Ned head. Oh, nice. Just a little micro jig. And I was tipping it with huh. just a purple. Oh, that's cool. Call daddy. Nice tackle. Um, but yeah, you know, you start off, learn to fish a tube. Fish it well, understand what you're feeling, the rocks, is it a soft bottom, is it a hard bottom, is it small gravel, is it bigger rocks, you know, and as you kind of learn and then you just roll that into, you know, you know, sometimes subtle things make a difference, just going to, I'm going to go backwards every time I do this, but uh, just fishing a net. Uh, but, you know, even when that's different versus an exposed head versus the concealed head in a tube, just how it scrapes and drags on the bottom. Uh, you know, that's one of the things I love about winter fishing. You get out there and it's cold and it's quiet and there's no boats. And you're just fishing and you can feel that tube dragging. It's like, okay, there's over a rock. And then you get that bite. And, I mean, that's a rush. I imagine that's what a drug addict feels like. Uh, you know, yeah. just getting that, uh, getting that high when you feel that that tap. Uh, you know, some days you get out there, you just want to feel the tap one more time. You don't even care if you catch the fish. And when you when you mention that, like, how would you describe the bite in the winter time? Because I I I equate it to like you have a leaf sometimes just on the end of your line. Uh, it varies a lot. Yeah. So sometimes it's just mushy. You pick up, there's a little bit of weight. It feels like a leaf. You know, basically this time of year, if you feel something set yep. the hook, because uh, you just never know whether it's a stick, a leaf, or a fish. Um, but that's actually with these tube heads I use, I found it works good in the wintertime is that teardrop. I told you I'm going to go backwards every time. Uh, it's that teardrop ah. head. And there's some, I just feel like it is more of a distinct bump when they suck that in with that bigger teardrop going in first. Um, so that's, that's what I like to use for that, but it, it will change. Sometimes they'll hammer a bait in the middle of winter. You know, it depends on what conditions are. It, it, what the conditions and you are. mentioned a lot of the classic bottom bumping baits. One thing I've seen this this past year, um, experimenting with uh, jerkbait, float and fly, Demiki rig on, on the section that I'm at, it seems like a small mouth, if something floats by their head, will generally have a more aggressive response than if it's a tube or a Ned rig right on the bottom. 
in their face. Like they will stare at that stupid ass thing for an hour and a half before they make a decision. But if you're throwing a jerk bait, even if you're moving the jerk bait slow because the current's going there, they got to make a decision. Am I going to eat this or not? Is there any moving baits that you throw this time of year? Uh, you know, it depends. You get a little bit of warming trend or you, um, uh, you hit high water. I'll, I'll throw spinner baits all year long. Wow. I'll try them. Um, of course, jerk baits are typical. I mean, I got, that's a good one. You know, backwards are just the X wraps. Sometimes I find a little bit of the feathered treble makes a difference. Um, the pointer 78. Mm, that one has some battle scars. I see. <laughs> 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 Actually, I just caught a whole bunch on the Upper Potomac. Uh, when was that? Right after Christmas. What, what color is that? Uh, you know what? I don't know. American Shad, okay. something like that, maybe. American Shad, interesting. Oh, it's got a little bit of chartreuse line there. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good color. I like that color. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, like I said, my stuff's basic. I don't, uh, I mean, there's a million colors you can throw in a million baits, but what works, works. I mean, sometimes when the water's dirty, oddly enough, I'll throw a uh, yellow perch jerk bait, which hmm. works well, even though no yellow perch, but somebody didn't tell the smallmouth that, I well, guess. And they'll hit some interesting things. And you've mentioned spinner baits. Um, do you make any modifications? Because the, the tales I've heard of smallmouth and spinner baits is that they're going to just absolutely destroy your blade and your wire and you can sometimes have an issue where they're hitting the blades and not the, the bait itself do you make any modifications to anything uh when you spin a bait fish no um basically if i'm buying a bait it better work as it is without having to modify it or i don't feel like it's the right bait so you know i get a lot of my stuff from snaggler tackle um, so you know, backwards once again, so, you know, he does all the spinner baits in there. So I've had such good luck with these. I don't have to modify them. You know, this is one I'll use in dirty water, cold water. Um, you know, he's already got them with the turtle backs. So you can fish a little slower. It's got more vibration. You know, this is a half ounce, but it's a quarter ounce profile. Um, you know, because they do. I don't know if it's going to show. Yeah, up it shows now. up. But um, you know, it's got the bead in the end there, so it helps keep from losing that uh, blade on the end. But you know, with any of them, you fish them long enough, and I'm terrible about boat flipping. So Same. once you boat flip forty yeah. or fifty fish in, you know, the wire's going to break on it, but. At that point, I'm pretty content with what I call stinger off. hook or no stinger hook for your spinner bait fishing. Um, so it depends if I can catch them without, I will throw without, but you can feel when they're short striking or grabbing, you can see them knock it to the side, the blades roll, and then I'll add particularly in dirty or muddy water, a grub and a, and a trailer hook. The grub, dude, I have not heard somebody mention a grub in a long ass time. That has fallen out. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I mean, I think the Kai Tech killed it or just swim base in general. Cause I remember like the Linder brothers from in fishermen talking about swimming a grub. And I feel like once the little swim baits came on the market, like it, people just stopped using them. Yeah. I don't fish those straight up, but I'll use them as a trailer on the uh, spinner bait. Just give it a little extra bulk, a little extra vibration, help you slow it down mm. a little bit. Yeah, no, that no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Do you ever go? Do you ever adjust your blades at all, or is that just the the blades that you use? Uh, no, no. I mean, he's pretty much got these dialed in. Um, you know, I should have brought a different one here, but you know, of course, I showed you this one. It's got the turtle back blades. Um, you know, this is a thin wire spinner bait. Uh, so I think it's just a 32 gauge. It's got an oversized willow leaf blade on it. Uh, there's another model that he makes for boosters or for burning them in the summertime. Uh, so they have smaller blades, stiffer wire, thinner skirts. So, so like I said, you know, I don't like to buy stuff I have to modify. I mean, he's pretty much got all these dialed in for what you need based on conditions or the season. 
Um, yeah, I didn't bring a, bring any of the boosters. I could have showed you those, but um, you know, just the difference in the size and the blades. No, that, I mean, dude, that that's fantastic stuff. Um, I mean, because again, like you can catch them on a chatter bait, a swim bait, a, a swim jig, a, a spinner bait. I mean, it's insane that. The Susquehanna, at least it seems like it just sets up for power fishing too. I've had a couple of people come on the show and be like, you can power fish a lot more on the Susky than you would think, which is interesting because I'm a Ned rig tube light line guy, generally speaking. Uh, well, really both rivers you can power fish. And again, the fish don't know what river they live on. That's true. Um, so, uh, you know, for the most part from April till November, I'm going to throw a spinnerbait first. Hmm and see if I can catch them. And then from there, I'll adapt to a jerk bait or to soft plastics. Or it was actually interesting this summer. Uh, it was really great. I was fishing a ton of, uh, backwards every single time, just these swing heads, football head swing jig. And I just put one of those little uh, plastic crawl daddies just on the end. Fish it like a crankbait across the bottom. And I don't know how many hundreds or thousand fish are caught on that this year. That's brilliant. Was, uh, That's a brilliant cool. thing. I mean, people use those on, on reservoirs all the time, but I don't think they thought about, you know, using that on river systems, especially. Yeah, no, it's, and it's funny, you know, it, uh, like 2018, 19, I was catching a ton of fish on them and it kind of seems to slow down a little bit. I didn't fish it as much. And then this past year, so, but just, you know, when you learn a bait, you can fish it well, it's easy to kind of adapt and switch based off of, you can tell how they're biting or whether they're chasing or if they're ripping a tail yeah. off, um, just picking up on little signs that you need to adjust. That, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Everyone better be taking notes that are, that are listening to this right now. This is the absolute choose. Do you dabble at all in the toothy stuff, like the muskies and the walleyes, uh, when you do guides or are you just strictly smallmouth? Um, basically smallmouth. You know, I had one client that, um, uh, he was from Wisconsin. He wanted to catch a muskie in Maryland since he moved here. So he called me up and I'm like, uh, I'll refer you to some muskie guys that you'll do better. He's like, no, 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 you're my guy. Take me out. So we went out and he caught one, oh, wow. um, actually right by, right by you, right out of Williamsburg. That's, there. that's the muskie capital um, right there. Yeah. <laughs> so. But yeah, no, m most of mine are accidental. Dude, it's becoming, I mean, it's not issues, the wrong word. It's becoming a pleasant right. surprise um, with how many muskie are actually jamming up, especially at the Williamsport up towards uh, Hancock and like Paw Paw on, on the upper Potomac proper. Um, does Susky have any kind of, of pike or muskie or is it not? I don't know. Oh, yeah, there's, okay. there's muskie, yeah. Hmm, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'll, I'll lose a half dozen spinner baits to bite off every year. Do you? When you're up in Canada, do you ever put like a metal leader or is that just a part of the tax for fishing in those areas? Cause there's so many pike up there. Uh, usually not. Cause I don't like how it affects the action of a bait. Um, but this place I'd mentioned we went to this year, there were so many pike, um, that, yeah, you know, I was just throwing that biffle bug for bass and, and we were catching 36 and 37 inch pike uh, when you didn't get bit off. So I started fishing those on the That's smart. Uh, but generally, uh, now I don't put one. Stone. No, it's hard. And I'm starting like, I know there's more and more guys that are fishing uh, big glide baits for smallmouth. And unless you're made of money, I highly suggest, even though it might affect the action of your bait a little bit, you might want to throw a leader on there before you throw a $400 glide bait. Uh, Cause you know, the toothies will find it. Uh, I lost one to that <laughs> because I was an idiot. Um, they are so good at breaking you off. <laughs> They're really good at it. Yeah. It's bad enough losing a 25 yeah. two. Uh, you know, I don't need to lose the 400. Yeah. One. Yeah. I'll get enough thrill and action off the regular. Dude, and those things are not afraid of the boat. That's what's so fascinating is, a, you know, a four pound smallmouth is terrified of your boat, but, uh, that muskie will just stare at you the whole time. It's insane. Yeah. I actually caught one uh, spinner baiting uh, just from you at uh, Williamsport there. It was super low and clear. And just watch that thing cruise right over to the boat and just wait 
for the spinnerbait to come by and just like a missile, the golf grabbed it. It was jumping up out of the air, you know, six, seven feet away That's from the boat. Awesome. And it was, it's fun. Do you fish that uh, stretch very much? Um, just, I guess, the, the upper Potomac proper before the confluence? Um, a little bit. You know, sometimes if you get half a day or something, I'm like, all right, I'm itching to go fish. I'll hit something closer here. Uh, but most of the time, I'll still head further down below uh, Harpers Ferry. It, it, it seems like it's a different river. Um, and I know just know because like I fish big slack and four locks a ton in my boat since I don't have a jet. And I don't know, the smallmouth fishing, it's just different. I don't know if it's like we had a fish kill or whatever. We have a ton of smallmouth, but we don't have the size. I think uh, a, a Thursday nighter, seven pounds of cashew check, but it's not like these 22 pound sacks they're pulling out of Brunswick and in the Lovettsville area. Uh, the quality of fish is definitely better further down, um, but it's just not great habitat with the dams and the low head dam at Williamsport. And you get the boat traffic, um, you know, above dam four. Or so um, actually a friend of mine uh, lives off of uh, in falling waters. He has a ramp right above the uh, Potomac fishing game club. And if you get further up river, uh, there's some decent fish up there. But you got to get up into the Conica water. jig. No one talks about that. There's like no access to it, but the Conica jig is, is like yep. insane. The amount of crayfish in that thing it's, and that's the, the thing that dumps in at Williamsport is that Creek, but they're oh, yeah. a ton of smallmouth in that sucker. And it's crazy. Like I'm just, just basically like what you said is you can go on the Conica jig and you can catch some fat ones. But then as soon as you get into the upper Potomac, it's just like, it's a completely different population of fish. And I think you're right. The habitat is there's something off about the habitat. There really is. Uh, this, it's just too slow a flow. They like the current. You know, it's a, you know, you get surprised how fast a current they will go in um, at any time of year. I mean, they, they will like they like the flow. Plus, the flathead are really thick up that way too. I think that could also be a small problem. I don't know how big of one, but. Um, I mean, I'm not catching any googly eye really up near Williamsport anymore, um, or bluegill like I used to. So who knows? Uh, I've barely caught any since all the high water in 2018. I've been in five years and maybe I've caught 10 rock bass or bluegill since then. Now I've always wondered like how much of that has to do with the flathead and, and just the cyclical nature of the environment, because Based on what people have told me, it, the vegetation just now is starting to come back. This year, the aquatic vegetation was thick. And I'm hoping that means that the bluegill and the googly eye will probably have had a good spawn or two. And hopefully we'll see that bounce back next year. Because I wonder if that's what the high water event also contributed to, which is the destruction of habitat. Uh, I mean, it definitely wiped out all the vegetation. Uh, you're right. It's just now starting to come back. Um, you know, they're more open to predators and the, uh, what's that bird? Sounds like a donkey out there. I mean, those things will eat. The osprey. And, oh no. The, uh, blue, uh, the herring. Uh, no, the, uh, Com uh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, they will just destroy some fish. So, yeah, no, I think, you know, all those things, loss of habitat, um, you know, high water fish get pushed together. Um, those fish become food for another fish and all those things add no, up. They do. They really do. Um, I mean, so we've covered so much. I mean, the one thing, do you have any stories about you and your brother fishing that we can say on live television? Um, any good stories that come to mind? Oh man. I, I mean, I've got a million stories, you know, everybody jokes, um, he barely talks and I never shut up. So everyone, they can't figure out how we're actually related. Um, but he's a great person to go on a trip to Canada with because he just never talks. And he just, whatever boat you tell him to get in, he gets in and he just fishes all day. <laughs> Every once in a while you look back and, oh yeah, he's still there. But, um, oh man, story. You know, the stories, I, they're always, uh, topic related so i think they seem out of place otherwise but um but since we talked about canada 
you know, every trip we've been up, we're not every trip, but a few trips, someone has hooked himself. And I always make the joke about, oh, well, don't worry, I'll pull it out. And I do. Um, well, of course, this day or this last trip on the last day was throwing jerk baits for Pike and uh, got complacent. It was the last day. I didn't use grippers or anything. I was holding a small Pike. It flopped, buried the treble hook right mm. in my hand. So, of course, everybody was excited that um, I got to be the victim of getting the hook pulled this time. But Oh, my God. I am blessed. I've only had one of those incidents. How did you get it out? Um, it was close enough. I just pushed the uh, point back through so it could cut the uh, barb off and then pull it out that way. No, that's my biggest fear is dealing with that. I had one in my, in my chin that went to the bone once that was terrible. We'd use the, 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 the line trick for God. I'm ter- uh, Yeah. Uh, it's paranoia I have with trips. I, so I don't like to throw a lot of travel hooks when you have three people in the boat because I just feel like someone's going to get hooked at some point. Yeah, that's going to happen. Um, would you take your boat up to Canada or you get one up there? Uh, depends on where we go, but generally oh, I take oh, wow. mine. How hard is that to do yeah. with like the border and stuff? I guess it's not Mexico, um, so. Well, I don't know. For some reason, I must be flagged because about... And probably every other trip I get pulled over and searched and, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but, you know, that, that'll be some stories from uh, my brother. If you talk to him again, you know, the times we've been sitting on a bench watching him rip everything out of my truck in the boat God. and searching everything. Good Lord. That's insane. I don't know if that'd be worth it to take my boat, um, but I don't have a rock proof. Do you still have a rock proof or, or do you have something else now? Yeah, rock. What do you think about those? Just in general. Love it. Love it. Um, that boat will do so much more than what you need it to do. Um, you know, and I don't run it like some guys do, you know, just to say you'll be able to bat out of hell. But yeah. But when you get yourself in a spot and you need it. Uh, I was actually fishing up on the Allegheny, and the Allegheny's pretty tame. It just tapers up into shallow riffles and then tapers down in deeper water. And it wasn't a lot of big rocks. And we came up to a long one. It was Sunday afternoon, and it was full of these great big boulders. So I looked at it for a while, and I'm like, ah, screw it. Let's go. So I just idled down, and with the plastic on the bottom, it's like four-wheel drive, and you're bouncing off all the rocks, and we get down, and uh, we were fishing for a little bit, and the guy I was with, and he's like, do you want to try to get up above there? I'm like, yes. I can't even concentrate just thinking about what it's going to be like. And so I run around these little grass beds and up to this section of water. And when I came up to the top of it, the water was so shallow, you could see it rolling over oh my the ground. And I thought, well, I just turned around, like, hang on. So I just buried him, like, well, I'll go as far as I can before I beach it. And it must just push water up in front of the boat enough. It, it ran through 75 yards of almost, almost dry. Um, never touched. But at, at that moment, you're happy to have you a boat got, like that. You got some brass on you because I don't, if you guys that are running a big like Phoenix or Skeeter or Ranger, I don't... You, the stones you have to have to be just like, yep, yeet, and you hit some of these areas. I've been in a jet boat once or twice, and you find Jesus real quick just when you, you trust the guy that's driving that boat. <laughs> well, I love when it's low and clear, and I have people in the back of the boat, and you go over at rocks the size of a yeah. pickup truck that are six inches down, and I see them lifting their feet up. Like, oh, oh, we're going to hit. And don't worry, we're okay. I think- do you have a GPS or anything like to mark your spots or, or if you do, what kind of electronics are you running? Uh, I have a couple hummingbirds on there, but I, I don't really use them. Um, you know, once you get out, you kind of know where the spots, I mean, there's a few spots on the upper Potomac where there's some deep water ledges that are hard to see that I'll, I'll mark those. But other than that, I mean, I don't even look at the water temperature. Mm. Interesting. 
Scott, like if people want to find you to book a trip with you uh, this year, how can they find you? Um, so I've got a website, uh, sjfishingadventures.com, uh, Facebook, Instagram. If you don't mind looking at old pictures, uh, maybe I'll get my brother to do some posting over the winter for me. So, uh, looks a little more current. Um, but yeah, you know, I do a limited number. I, you know, for a while I was doing about 50 or 60 trips a year and, um, uh, you know, that's a lot, uh, cause I work full time also. So, you know, I've cut back. I'm more limited in how much I do now. So, you know, I want it to be enjoyable for me and still be at my best for a client and not be tired and worn out and in, in a pissy mood for them. No, it's always about finding that work, work-life work balance. And then guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Uh, you know, please give SJ Fishing Adventures a, a follow, check him out. Uh, the areas I believe that you service Susquehanna River, the Upper Potomac, and in, we're talking the Upper Potomac proper from the confluence down towards the falls. And then also, I'm assuming you also do towards Big Slack, Hancock, and Paw Paw as well. A little, uh, bit. a little bit. I mean, I generally don't go up that way. I mean, yeah, I just, the quality of the fish is so much better going down. Than- right. I feel better. To right on. Down that so line. guys, go check them out. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about today. Uh, also, please go check us out on Patreon. Uh, our goal is to create a nonprofit so we can help supplementally stock the smallmouth population in places like the Upper Potomac, the Shenandoah River, uh, and help our, all of our lakes. So please go check out our Patreon. You can help us hit that goal. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.